Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS, and thanks for joining us today. I am Dr. Rachel Rosen, a postdoctoral research fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, Steve Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at John Hopkins University, Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Justin White at Boston University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and, com and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Jamie Hartman Boyce from the University of Massachusetts Amherst to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Rachel. Today, we begin our winter 2025 season with a grand rounds presentation by Benjamin Toll entitled E-Cigarettes in the US, Use by Physicians, Prevalence, Intentions to Quit, and Findings from Several Trials Investigating Methods for Quitting. Based out of the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. Benjamin Toll is a licensed clinical psychologist, a professor of public health sciences and psychiatry, vice chair of research for the Department of Public Health Sciences, co-director of the Lung Cancer Screening Program, and director of the Health Tobacco Treatment Program. Dr. Toll has received grants from the U.S. National Institutes of Health, including multiple R01 grants from the National Cancer Institute, and is an author of over 150 peer-reviewed publications relating to nicotine and tobacco research, including several large clinical trials investigating smoking cessation and several pilot clinical trials testing treatments for e-cigarette use. He has also published multiple clinical practice guidelines and official policy statements from major medical associations and is the current president of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. Dr. Toll, thank you for presenting for us today. All right, thank you very much, Jamie. That was a lovely introduction. Uh, we did not plan to both wear green, but we are both wearing green, which is really great. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so here, here we go. And then I'm going to start to go to presentation mode. And can Serena or um, Jamie just let me know that you can see it, that it's sharing in, in presentation mode? It's looking good. OK, great. All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, so. Um, I am gonna, I appreciate Jamie and Mike and the board for having me come talk today. Um, we're gonna talk about a variety of subjects concerning e-cigarettes and tobacco, um, conflicts of interest in the past 10 years. So I have testified since 2015 on behalf of plaintiffs who have filed litigation against the industry that's mostly but not exclusively Philip Morris, Reynolds, and Jewel Labs. Um, I worked as a paid consultant on a single advisory board about e-cigarettes for Pfizer quite some time ago. So um, 2018 um, is when I, I did that. Um, and we, of course, know that their drug that they represented when LOE approximately 2019 or 2020. Um, so I just want to give you my professional perspective, just so that you understand the lens that I view our work through. So I direct the operations for a tobacco treatment service that touches approximately 10,000 tobacco users per year. It's a large health system, 11 hospitals, and many, many outpatient clinics. Um, usually, we provide medications for tobacco treatment. That's mostly 
patches, gum, and lozenges. Um, in the hospital, uh, th those are what's more prevalent. Um, and most of our physicians, especially hospitalists, don't feel comfortable prescribing a medication that needs follow-up. Um, although we, we, of course, are trying to change that somewhat. Um, about half or more than half of these medically compromised patients have died or will die from use of tobacco. So it really hurts my heart when I open up our medical record and there's a big black box that comes up in my medical record, which is epic. There's a big black box that comes up and says, this patient is deceased. And that's very upsetting for, for me. It, it hurts every time, frankly. Um, and so I am a fierce, a fierce advocate for patients. And all of these patients that use tobacco and have a myriad of psychiatric and of medical problems, they need our help for the quitting process and for their other health issues, frankly. So if they quit smoking, if they quit vaping, in general, especially for smoking, in general, there are, it, it will improve almost all of their other health issues. I'm also a passionate, um, a passionate advocate for trainees and for colleagues. I feel that trainees are our future, and so we must fight for them because in 20 years, I'll be gone and hopefully they'll be here and they'll be fighting that good fight. So um, uh, I am funded by the MUSC Hollings Cancer Center. That's the grant number there. Some of these um, are of the of the pilots that I'm gonna mention are, are funded by startup funds from the Cancer Center. I've had multiple grants, as Jamie mentioned. That's all public on this website. As Jamie mentioned, I am the president of SRNT, but uh, the content of this presentation is not the official views of SRNT. So this is kind of a broad framework of what we're going to talk through today. We're going to go through considerations for providers concerning e-cigarettes. We'll talk about the importance, the very, very vast importance of 18 to 24 year olds um, and e-cigarette prevalence. We're gonna talk about um, the, the very clear data that show that most e-cigarette users have plans to quit. And those data of, are from PATH. Um, we're going to go through a pilot study of NRT, that's patch plus lozenge, for quitting vaping. And then the last trial that we'll run through is a review of, of, of the drug formerly called Chantix. It's now generic. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, it was Ch Chantix or Chantix in the rest of the world. Um, now generic versus placebo for quitting vaping. So if I have seen any further, it's only because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Of course, Isaac Newton said that, and he was talking about all of the scientists before him, like Galileo and Magellan, who had whose work he had built upon. And so these are my mentors and sponsors. Um, and I think you guys can see my, my pointer, right? So I'm just gonna point. So this is Mark Sabell. Um, he's a psychologist uh, that's now retired, but that's who I trained with for graduate school. Uh, Mark is probably best known for creation of the timeline fallback or TLFB. And funnily, I said, um, I mentioned in, in Jamie's podcast called Let's Talk E-Cigarettes, which is fantastic, by the way, and, and available on you know, Spotify and Apple and all of the streaming platforms. Certainly go listen to it. It's a great podcast. But they have this cute part where 
Um, there, if you say something like timeline fallback, there's a dog that barks. It goes, and and they say obscure scientific reference, and then they say what it is. So apparently, Mark's timeline is an obscure scientific reference. Um, but it is the way that most of us measure smoking and drinking behaviors. And Mark in graduate school really taught me how to write a good paper and taught me how to be a rigorous scientist. Next is Stephanie um, from Yale, who was one of my two postdoc mentors. And Stephanie really is an incredibly rigorous scientist. And she taught me, she's currently the co-PI of the ELT course. She taught me how to just write a really good grant and how to be a very thoughtful scientist. Um, and 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 by the way, we're we're still in in touch. I still see her. I just talked to Mark a few weeks ago. He just turned eighty, um, and he is now retired. And then there's Peter Salovey, um, who was one of my postdoc mentors, and he in introduced me and and helped me to become um, a game frame uh, um, investigator. So a framing of a framing messages type of a scientist where I looked rigorously at game frame you know, versus you know versus lost frame messages. Um, and Peter, when I met Peter in 2002, he was the chair of the Department of Psychology. And I was so excited, I was like, wow, I'm 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 being trained by the chair of psychology. Um, and then he just rose through the ranks at Yale. Um, through a few deanships and then provost, and then he was president for many years, and he just stepped down uh, last year. Um, he's still faculty at, at Yale, and Peter really taught me how to delegate. So Peter surrounds himself with a huge group of very smart people, and he taught me how to just delegate things in a, a a way that allows you to get a lot done, frankly. Um, next is Roy Herbst, who is a very long time sponsor and a professor at Yale. Roy brought me into the world of cancer um, and he brought me to the big, the big conferences and he introduced me to the CEOs and got me to publish in very large cancer journals and he helped me to go to congressional briefings. He's just a really lovely guy that cares very much about cancer and science. Um, and, and he's been a great sponsor and a great friend. And of course, we of course we all know Dr. Cummings, who I met Mike. Um it was the early 2000s back when there were TTARPs, and that stands for uh, Transdisciplinary Tobacco Use Research Center. And I was at a TTARP conference and you know, Mike and I were in line for lunch. And Mike said, it, it'd be great for you to test your framing through my quit line. And I said, really, that sounds great. And then um, from there, from there, Mike helped me get my very first R21. And since then, I've worked with Mike on, on numerous studies and it's been a great relationship. And Mike is a very careful scientist that is incredibly loyal and a force in this field. And we all appreciate his passion very much. So from here, um, I am now going to talk about teams and my teams. So, so this quote, my teammates have my back and I have theirs. This is from two-time MVP Lamar Jackson, who is the quarterback of the Ravens, where I'm from. So I'm from Baltimore, and I'll talk about that a bit during this talk. But in Baltimore, we talk about the flock and having a team that matters, a team that you care about. And so this is my flock. So we have a large team at MUSC of great scientists and great administrators that just do wonderful things. So um, that's my team and I care very much about this team. And it's a team that we are 
excited to work with on a daily basis. So one of the team members is Dr. Tracy Smith, who worked with me and, and Dr. King on a, uh, a letter that came out in Nature Medicine. And so that's Dr. Brian King, who we all know and who is um, the director of the Center for Tobacco Products at the FDA and a lovely guy and a great scientist. Um, and we approached Dr. King. So Tracy and I approached Dr. King, said this is a picture of Brian and I from the Scotland conference. Um, we approached Brian at the Texas conference. So before Scotland was San Antonio, Texas, and we approached him and said, I had just met with a, a physician from um, a, a very good school that I'm not going to mention um, the name, but he said to me, and it, you know, this was an oncologist. I meet with loads of oncologists and he said, vapes, those are worse than smoking, right? <laughs> and oh, well, I didn't put my head in my hands at that time, but I did say to Brian, you know, I am very opposed to youth vaping, but I do think that our physicians need to, to, to know that in general, e-cigarettes have less risk than combusted cigarettes. And that was what started a conversation and led to this important letter. And I'm just gonna share our conclusions if I can get this thing to move forward. Um, so, First line is that clinicians should provide counseling and an approved medication for treatment. There's no question. So for a cigarette smoker that comes to your clinic, start with meds and with counseling. For adults that continue to smoke, our doctors and providers may consider talking about the relative risks of products and educate patients that exclusive use of any cigarette instead of cigarettes would cut down on exposure to known toxins and carcinogens. And they need to reinforce that the importance of complete transitioning away from combusted products to get the full, full benefits to their health. If patients do choose to use an e-cigarette for complete transitioning, providers should make patients aware of the 23 products that have been authorized by the FDA. We just hosted Brian here at, for, for one of our named lectures. It was the Rosenblatt lecture that's hosted by Mike. Um, and Brian said at that time, and I agree, you should be talking about the products that have gone through the very rigorous review by the FDA and been shown scientifically to have fewer toxicants and fewer carcinogens. So it's important that, and I, I, I know that this is a polarizing issue, but I do agree with Dr. King that that's what we should do. And the other thing that we say in the article that I didn't have room in this presentation to, 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 to type out, but we'll say verbally is that we're very opposed to youth use, one. And two, our doctors may talk about the idea of complete transitioning away from combusted products, but the end goal should be quitting the vape too. So they can vape for a specified time period, but our end goal sh should be to transition then off of that vape. So I'm gonna um, transition now to talking about um, my views on e-cigarettes. So I, I grew up in Baltimore and my dad was poor and we had mice, this is a mouse. Um, and mice, mice are vermin, comes from the Latin word vermis, which means worm. So that's the little worm-like larvae and, 
and the insects that infest food. So mice poop and pee all over your residence. It's quite gross. They spread illness, they spread death, they, they eat your food. So if your cereal is not in plastic, if it's in, if it's in a cardboard box, they'll chew right through and they'll get to your cereal. They, they hurt your sleep. So they scurry through your walls, they scratch. They're really like, they're really a bad, bad thing to have inside your residence. For me, that's a combusted cigarette. This is a cat. In fact, this is my cat. Her name is Roxanne or Roxy. So yeah, as you can see, she's much more attractive than mice. So cats in general are much more attractive than mice, but they do poop and pee. It's in a litter box, so it's more contained, but it is still a burden. They cause bad allergies to humans. They scratch up and destroy your furniture. They bite and scratch you. A cat bite is in fact quite dangerous. So if you have a true full cat bite, it can lead to sepsis. It can cause very serious problems. For me, that's an e-cigarette. So to be clear, we have mice who are really, really bad. That's a combusted cigarette. And then a much more appealing and attractive animal, but that still has several issues and several problems and still has some risk and problems that come with it. So now I'm gonna try to speed up because I see it's 12, it's 12.23. So um, I wanna transition to talking about the importance of young adults. So the industry has always cared about young adults. So Philip Morris called these yams and yas and they studied them and they noted in their previously secret documents that they foreshadowed the future performance of brands. So these are from the San Francisco library. The only segment that would not fill out the surveys are yams. Um, and share was de declining among yafs and followed by softening among 25 to 34. Yafs were of particular importance because they because they represent and they foreshadow the brand's long-term performance. When you turn 18, you are generally graduating high school, possibly going to college, you're on your own, you have your own, your, your own money, and that's when a time of great transition and a time where if you can establish brand loyalty, it stays with you. So, uh, this is Brandon Sanford and Naomi Brownstein. So Brandon is, at the time that he did this study, was one of my postdoc fellows. He is now an assistant professor of family medicine at MUSC. Um, and that's Naomi Brownstein, who is an associate professor of biostats here in the Department of Public Health Sciences. So this is using uh, waves one through six of the FDA's PATH study. And that's a nationally representative study, of course, of it varies, but approximately 45,000 people that that represent our, our country. These are the definitions for established smoking and established vaping. So here's what Brandon found. Um, so these dark bars are established smoking and the years here so this starts in 2013 and it goes up through 2021 so the, the 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 darker brown bars are smoking and it's unequivocally going down and these lighter bars are vaping and the white bars are the never smokers that vape so if you look at these bars they are unequivocally going up at the time we published this, wave six was restricted use, we obtained it, and we were floored that there are now, as of three years ago, there are now more never smoking vapors than established smokers. And that brings us to the great Wayne Gretzky that said, 
I escape to where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. So the puck has been here. It has been in smoking, but it's going to be in vaping. So we need as a field to shift a large number of our resources towards treatment of vaping. Why, why should we do that? Well, this brings me to Dr. Palmer, who was one of my, um, my pre-doc and postdoc fellows that is now an instructor and soon to be assistant professor at MUSC. She did two great studies of pathway four and five in which she found that approximately three-fifths in wave four planned to quit and a smaller number had tried to, to quit. And in wave five, it was two-thirds plus that planned to quit um, and almost 20% that had tried to quit. And I believe I'm supposed to stop here and pause to see if there's questions. Thanks so much, Ben. And thanks also to the call out to our podcast, which I appreciate. Um, so our discussant today is Dr. Joanna Strecht, an assistant professor from Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I'm going to first open up to Joanna for any comments or questions she might have at this point. I will save my questions for the end, but just a comment. I loved your nod to patient care, mentoring your own mentors, your mentees, and kind of the cycle of mentorship. Um, yeah, and I've enjoyed the talk so far, and I have some questions uh, for the end, but I don't want to interrupt your flow now. Okay, great. So I'm going to keep going then. Thank you, Dr. Streck um, and Dr. Arthur Bryce. Um, I'm going to move forward um, to a study that was con conducted by Dr. Palmer. Um, and I believe that you have access to the six papers I'm talking through today. Um, Amanda looked at, uh, this was a mix of both mono vapors and dual users. We all know, of course, that dual use means use of both cigarettes and e-cigarettes. In this study, she randomized 30 participants in a two-to-one fashion to treatment versus control. Treatment was approximately one month of the 21 milligram patch and the four milligram lozenge. The control was a referral to the South Carolina SWIT, to the South Carolina quit line. Um, and you you can see right here that the two to one, you know, gave us about 18 that got treatment and 12 that got control. Um, so what she found was 40% of the people in the treatment group that got patch plus lozenge. 20 cigarettes. Unfortunately, no one in the control group quit. And then the dual, and then it gets really interesting for the dual users. So notably, none of the dual users quit smoking. A quarter quit vaping, but continued to smoke. So that's the wrong way on the, the continuum of, of risk. We want folks ideally to quit both, but if they're gonna quit one, that they quit smoking and they keep vaping. Um, so Dr. Palmer is now, so I, I think, and we agree that it may be that dual users need higher doses of nicotine. So Dr. Palmer was funded thankfully by the ACS to do, uh, again, a small pilot of 45 subjects in which it's varying doses of NRT, but higher doses for dual users. And um, her last her last follow up is going to be in about a week. So we are very excited to see those data and stay tuned as we hope to publish those data in the near future. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then the last trial I'm going to talk through today is with my colleague and good friend, Lisa Puchito, who is at Yale um, and was just a few years behind me starting at Yale. I'm not going to say what years because it was a long time ago, but we have been uh, close colleagues and friends for about 15 years. 
Um, and this is a group of people at Yale and at MUSC who have um, who have uh, worked on this study. Um, and Lisa presented these data in Scotland. So you know, this was a two month study that was across two sites. So we got 20 people down here in Charleston and Lisa's group got 20 at Yale. Um, we, you know, we then randomized them to drug or placebo um, that went for, so the med use went from week zero up through week eight, and then we followed them for four more weeks for a one month follow-up. It's a primary care model. So this was a self-directed booklet, a five to 10 minute phone call, but we tried for five. Um, I did I did a handful of these calls, like just to make sure that the operations were going well in this pilot. Um, and the the outcomes were point prevalence at seven for the past seven days, right here at week eight and right here at week 12. So here's what the group looks like. So the split on gender was good. Um, it was a mostly white group. Um, the, the history of smoking was about half. Um, most people vape daily, um, and th through the day. So they were continuously vaping. It's a very modern group. So they kept vaping. Um, they had vaped for about five years. Um, this e-cig dependence is the promise measure. And these are very high numbers. Um, so the, you know, this is a dependent group um, and they're mostly using dispos and carts. So they're, they, they are using almost exclusively um, those devices and they're almost exclusively salt-based. Um, and it's a mixed psychiatric group. So many psych problems as we see in most samples of tobacco users in modern times. So um, here's what we did. We randomized 40 people to drug or placebo. Um, one participant had a dose reduction. I called her several times and consulted with Dr. Gray, who's our, our psychiatrist on the MUSC side um, and talked you know, with her about, she had high nausea. Um, and so we talked about cutting back her dose. Uh, nine other participants had AEs that were the common kind of usual suspects for this asset. So that's nausea, insomnia, and vivid dreams. Um, here's the, the, the findings for this preliminary study. So a nice treatment difference between treatment and placebo at the end of treatment that that degrades slightly, but is still is still very much there at the one month follow up. What's interesting is that participants that had a smoking history, regardless of group, had a much higher chance of quitting. So that's an interesting finding, and, and that was a significant finding. Um, now let's talk about smoking. Obviously, one fear of treating vaping, especially if you have a smoking history, is that you're is that you're going to go back to smoking. Um, and we thankfully did not find that to be true in the drug group. So we had two participants for whom that occurred, and for the participant that took the drug asset, um, they quit both products, and for the patient that didn't have drug, she um, or, or he stopped smoking uh, and, and continued to vape. So what are the next steps for this study? So, um, so Lisa and I have an MPI grant that proposes a test of this drug asset versus placebo in a group of 326 mono vapors that would be split evenly between New Haven and Charleston. 
Um, there will be a rigorous test of several biological uh, markers, like like DNA damage across time. Um, we have a plan to examine several possible treatment moderators. This got a fundable score. So thank you to the NCI. The funding line was announced yesterday and we are below that funding line, thankfully. So here are the summary points. If an adult that smokes does not succeed through a first line treatment from the FDA, our, our doctors and providers may consider talking about the relative risks of e-cigarettes, the importance of complete switching, and make patients aware of the 23 vapes that are currently authorized by the FDA with an eventual goal of stopping all product use. Um, in the near future, these products will be the dominant form of tobacco use in this country. A very high number of people who use e-cigarettes plan to quit. Dual NRT may have some use in quitting for mono e-cigarette users, but higher doses of this drug are probably needed for dual users. The drug varenicline tartrate shows a good treatment signal for quitting e-cigarettes. The field, and I can't stress this enough, the field desperately needs high quality, large trials to help people that want to quit e-cigarettes to do so. And I'm gonna close by saying this, this work we do, it's hard. It's a very, very challenging set of studies. Science is hard. Preventing cancer is hard. These are all opportunities for us as a community to rise up and to help others. Please do your part. All these things, all the pressure, all the challenges, they are opportunities for our community of tobacco treaters and researchers to rise. And with that, I say thank you, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Ben. You've covered a lot in a short amount of time. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to first hand over to Dr. Joanna Streck, our discussant. Please do continue adding comments to the Q&A, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And so nice to hear how you're seeing the future of this field and future research that other people, including junior people, may want to get into, write a K on that topic. Um, I'm just curious, I'll just ask one of my sets of questions and then let the rest of the time be for all of the uh, questions in the chat. But sure. I'm curious what you think about the kind of nuance around physician and healthcare um, provider advice on e-cigarettes. So just thinking about like the how, if you have any thoughts or data around how you might advise someone who's exclusively smoking and wants to try out e-cigarettes to switch yeah. the question of gradual or abrupt. Um, and then also that great point that you listed around sharing the relative risks of e-cigarettes with tobacco cigarettes and any thoughts or data out there where um, a provider could look at how to talk about the relative risks, especially yeah. in light of what you shared that some of them actually think the opposite, that yeah. these things are more dangerous. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So when we, when Nature Medicine published that letter that is publicly uh, available, we tried, they, they, they paywall it, and I'm sorry that they paywall it, but they paywall it and there's no way to unpaywall letters for some reason. But so when Nature Medicine published that letter, the FDA created a suite of websites that talk about relative risks of the of the products. It's a lovely it's, website. It's public. I would encourage all of our physicians and providers to go to that website, learn what it says, take a look. It's not it's not challenging to understand, but I think it can be a little challenging to internalize because many right. physicians incorrectly think that smoking is better than vaping and it's the opposite. 
right? So there's less toxicants and less carcin and less carcinogens in vapes. So I would encourage your colleagues to go to that that website and and and, and just learn about these products and and have thoughtful conversations. So it may be that the person has asthma and it's and and it's not a good choice. Right. Um, or it may be that they tried Renaclin, they tried Bupropion, they tried Patch, and they feel very desperate and hopeless. They can consider maybe an e-cigarette. Um, and and but I I always stress though the plan is not to stay on the e-cigarette. The plan. So for my practice, I I never suggest e-cigarettes, but instead some of my patients they just come in and they're and they're vaping and say and say hey guess what doc you're gonna be so proud of me I quit smoking <laughs> so the first thing I do is I congratulate them and the second thing I say is that's great that you did that now we have to talk about trying to get you off of that product awesome. thank you of course and I see they sent that uh the relative risk piece in the chat which is awesome okay. but yeah Jamie if you want to do the chat questions I know we have a ton um that's all I had thank you absolutely thank you Joanna so and thank you everyone for keeping these brilliant questions coming in we'll get to as many of them as we can and any yeah. others will be sent to Ben at the end as well so if your question isn't asked don't panic so I'll start with one from Jaz Walia, who says, wonderful talk, Ben. You implied or said the end game was not just tobacco, but nicotine. We generally have accepted that if someone wants to use nicotine gum for years, decades, or even a lifetime is acceptable. Many physicians accept this, although it took many years to get to this point. Why would this be different for non-medicinal nicotine products, especially nicotine pouches? So hi, Jazz. Thanks for the good question. Um, it's a very thoughtful and very learned question, as usual, from Jazz. I would say for the vapes that we know have some levels of heavy metals, they have some levels of some chemicals that are not um, not air. Um, for, for those, I would say um, unequivocally, we have to stop those. So... I have many patients that want to use gum for years, and I say, go for it. And, and what I say is this, if you're going to stop that gum and go back to smoking, keep using that gum your, your entire life. That's like a blood pressure medicine. It's, it's keeping you safe, right? But for, for vapes jazz, I think that's not true because there are, there is some risk, the exact amount is not yet totally quantified, but there is some risk. For a tobacco-free pouch, I think that the jury is still is still out. We need more uh, pharmacological studies to look and see if there's risk. These are very new products. They're very appealing products. Um, you know, um, if Baker Mayfield is taking one on the sidelines of a nationally televised, of, of a huge game, um, then this is a, a big product that is that is very popular. So and and frankly, we know very little about these products. So I, I think what I would say, Jazz, is for the vapes, there is some risk and we must get people to quit those. For the tobacco pet for the pouches, I'd say that the jury is still out. Oh, you're you're muted, Jamie. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> You'd think after all these years, I'd be used to it. Uh, <laughs> alas. So we have a question from Norbert Zilatan schmidt asking if there's any solid scientific evidence for significant actual health benefits from quitting vaping. So what happens to people when they quit vaping? Do we know? Such a great question. We need data. There is very, very scant data and so in the two, I proposed the trial. So the trial that, that we hope is going to get funded is going to is going to examine that very that very issue where we're going to look across time prospectively if your health improves. Matt Carpenter and I are proposing a 
Kia won the four projects and one project that the that's led by Alana Rajewski, the entire project is to look prospectively across time for our cohort of a thousand patients to see what are the health improvements of quitting vaping. Frankly, we need data. We don't have data. As intelligent people, I think that we can agree that it's likely that there would be some improvements, unlike smoking, where there's going to be massive improvements. I predict that they're small, but you know, but consistent. Um, but I, I, I just don't know of, uh, of a large body of evidence that has looked through through this, and we desperately need it. Thank you. So a question here from Cheryl Olson. There will be multiple heated tobacco products in the U.S. market within the next few years. Mm -hmm. Based on use in other countries, such as Japan, among people who smoke, are you considering similar studies in HTPs? Well, I would say um, my colleague, Dr. Smith, and I have talked about this. Um, you know, one of the, of the big issues is production and if they're really going to be here. So as this community knows, um, there was a battle between P PMI and Altria um, in which they shut down production um, and importation of these, of these devices because they had two test markets. Um, and I, I believe, I, I guess the short answer is that I'm not planning studies till I see that these products are actually being used in this country. So, I mean, I, I am planning for my future studies. Uh, obviously I'll, I'll always study smoking, but I'm, I'm really doing a lot of vaping treatment studies now, because I think that's our future. Um, and if, if the so-called heat not burn comes to this country and takes off, I, I think that we, like we certainly, you, you should study it. Thank you. Um, moving on to a question from Matthew Bars. He notes that oh, in, <laughs> in your paper, uh, evaluating nicotine replacement therapy for vaping cessation, um, 196 people responded to the ad, but only 30 people were randomized, which is around 15%. Yeah. He asked if there's the possibility of any selection bias going on here and if that might affect conclusions. Well, you know, Matt, it's a, uh, especially the dual users are, are, um, an important group, but they have, um, they have a host of issues and we did screen out a large number of people. Um, there's, there's certainly always that possibility. I, I hope that's not true. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a question behind the question, but I'll say it's a very highly addicted group. And I think that dual users really like I'm confident in in the finding that dual users need high doses of drugs to feel that they are that they are able to get to quitting. Thank you. We have a question from Margaret LaPlante, which is, are any of the 23 FDA authorized devices authorized for cessation purposes? And she says, thank you. A very interesting discussion. Uh, they are not. So they are. So there's two paths for these products. One is Cedar, and that's a safe and effective rule. So that's like what the nicotine patch did. It's shown to be safe and effective for quitting. All of the all the authorized products are on a public health rule that shows that these that that these products have a scientifically measurable that that they have a lower amount of risk than a combusted product. So they are not shown to be safe and effective. I wish if I had like a wand that could make things happen, I wish that we could have a bunch of e-cigarettes that go the safe and effective route. I think that'd be great. So far, I've heard whispers that one company was maybe gonna do one product that way. And so far it's been crickets. I, I would love for 
for us to go the Cedar route. I, I don't see that happening, um, but it's certainly possible. Can I just ask a follow-up question from my own curiosity, Ben? Yeah. Given our current state of affairs and the fact that this might continue with no e-cigarettes going through the Cedar safe and effective route, where does that leave clinicians if they're talking about e-cigarettes for quitting smoking? Does that put them in a difficult position? I, I mean, I think the fact that it's authorized by the FDA makes at least the providers that I've talked to, it makes them a little more comfortable. But what you're asking, I think, is true. They're still not totally comfortable. So it makes them a bit more comfortable, but it's not. I mean, obviously, if you're a physician that is going to tell a patient to take a product, you want it to be entirely safe. Now, if your patient is, say, pregnant and is smoking and they've tried varenicline, patch, bupropion, and they're desperate, then maybe you're okay doing that. But it's still a hard sell to have a licensed healthcare provider fully recommend a product that they know has some risk. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Norbert Zilatan Schmidt. What, if you know, is the assumption of people who say they want to quit vaping about the danger level of vaping compared to smoking? So this is about perceptions. Oh, that's a really good question. So what is their perception? My understanding is that they perceive that it has high risk, um, and they want to quit. Um, we, we looked at pathway four and five and it was going up. We're going to look again at, at six and seven. Um, it's a really important question. My un understanding is that most people in the country think that, that e-cigarettes are quite dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And quite dangerous re related to smoking. Yes, that that they're that they're either the same or worse than than combusted smoking, which we we all know in in the field and you know, from the FDA, there's there's measurably less risk for 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 vapes, but that that is not well known. Yeah, yeah, same with many places in the world. Right. I think that's right. the best problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So some more questions coming in. Um, Nicole Krebs has asked, e-cigarette users are still a small percentage of the population. For your studies with e-cigarette users that want to quit, is it hard to identify those people for your trials? Can I tell you, it was so fast to get monovapors. Like, I was shocked. It felt like the old T-Turk days. So in the old T-Turk days, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we would fill up a giant room at Yale, like like 40 people. I mean, they were just calling, calling, calling. And then like now it's gotten much harder to find people that want to quit smoking. And we did this monovaping study with Chantix or, or Veraniclin, and we had loads of patients come, loads. I mean, it was really there. I, I was surprised. Um, and I will say, having done both now, I found that um, just in 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 the Charleston market, a lot of interest in the mono vapors in quitting, and interest, but a little bit lower for the dual users. So it's there, but it's not it's not as much as I mean these mono vapors. It, it I mean this study was a pleasure because they just kept coming. I mean, really easy. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, a question here from Cheryl Olson. Given your focus on cancer, at what point do you anticipate we might have useful data on e-cigarettes and cancer risk? Well, I mean, we're going to, in our study, certainly, we're going to look at DNA damage, inflammatory markers. So there's, there's obviously like a chain of events that leads to cancer. We're going to look at those various markers and see if those markers go down upon quitting vaping. And that, that'll be a strong signal. Um, and I, I'm just, I, 
I, the main goal of me doing this and of me doing these talks is to try to encourage our colleagues to conduct these trials. Do the trials. I would love you to help people to quit and to measure biological risk along the way. It's so important that the new trials have great markers of, of inflammation, of, of DNA damage, and all of, of the things. Great. Thank you. A question from Skip Murray. Is anyone doing follow-up studies to see if people who quit smoking with vapor products are still able to stay smoke-free for a long period of time, as in years? Skip, hello. Um, you know, I there are so few studies. Um, I do not know of any. I think that's a great idea. Obviously, our goal is to stop smoking. Obviously, our goal is for people to stay smoke free. One of my fears that was thankfully not borne out in the in the in the pilot studies that we've done that I presented is that is that you quit vaping and go back to smoking. That that's an uh I I think that's a reasonable fear that has to be mitigated for uh, us to all feel comfortable. So we don't want so there's there's a continuum of harm. This is air and this is smoking and vaping's in here i don't i'd like people to quit and go to no risk not to to quit and to go to higher risk that's not what we're going for and we really need good studies that have those long-term follow-ups thank you a question from george colidner and george apologies if i've mispronounced your last name i'm finding that my vaping and pouch using patients routinely use continuously similar to chain smoking cigarette smokers can you comment on the possibility that e-cigarettes and pouches cause less disease but are more addictive than tobacco cigarettes i can and and can i tell you this is a very polarizing subject in which i've been yelled at by people i think I think that in a way, if you think about vaping versus smoking, and, and, and by the way, a lot of my data comes from my live patients who I speak with and they, and they tell me what they do. So the thing about a vape it, is this, if you smoke cigarettes, it's 20 to a box, right? And then you, you have to light it, right? And then, and then when the, 20 cigarettes are done, you crush it and you throw it out. That's a, that's a very nice stopping point, right? If you have a 5,000 puff Kang vape, you can just go and go and go, and there's no fixed stopping point. The other thing is there's no fire for vapes. So I have patients that take their vape, they hit it, they put it under their pillow, and then they sleep, and they wake up maybe through the night, and certainly first thing, they take it and hit it straight away. With smoking, you, there's a few other steps, right? Because it burns. You got to like get the cigarette out. You got to light it. You might want to sit up. Like it's just harder, frankly. Um, so I I think, and we have data from, you know, one of the pathways that sh shows that it may be that, that vapes are slightly more addictive because of continuous you know, use. But that that's a emerging data. I'm not saying that that's definitely true, but I, I, I do think it's possible. Um, there's no pouch data that I know of. I do know that the pouches are highly addictive. I have patients that use them through the night um, and that use many, many tents. So, I mean, it is an addictive substance in a different vessel. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's all we have time for today. That was a brilliant talk. And thanks for dealing with all the rapid fire questions. Of course. We didn't get to yours. And I'm going to hand over to Rachel to close us out. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. And finally, thank you to our audience of 172 people for your participation today. Hope you have a top snatch weekend. Great. Thank you, everyone.